<laughs> Welcome, and thank you for joining us today for this virtual panel discussion, Catherine Hepburn Images Everything. I also hope you had a chance to watch the virtual museum exhibit presented by the Kate, Catherine Hepburn, Unintentional Trailblazer. This exhibit highlights unique pieces in the Kate's Museum collection, as well as features newly acquired letters from Kate's early career. These letters came to us from Kate's extended family and we're delighted to care for them and share them in our mission of being a lasting legacy for Catherine Hepburn. The Kate is committed to this mission and we're delighted to continue to grow our collection and share Kate's remarkable story. Uh, we're also looking uh, to the future for better ways of achieving this mission. So stay in touch and follow for exciting developments. As we move into Catherine Hepburn Images Everything, I'm happy to introduce our discussion moderator, Ann Nyberg. In addition to being the longest serving anchor on WTNH TV and as a founding member of the Cates Board of Trustees and the author of Remembering Catherine Hepburn, Stories of Wit and Wisdom About America's Leading Lady. Anne was also the recipient of the 2018 Spirit of Catherine Hepburn Award presented by the Kate. Welcome, Anne. Well, thank you. It's so thrilling to be here. And in the next hour, you're gonna learn so much about Kate from these women who are the keepers of Hep Catherine Hepburn's history. So let me introduce them as we get underway. And I hope you have your coffee or your Coke or whatever <laughs> it is to, to join us because it's gonna be a lot of fun. All right, let me first introduce from Ohio, because we're kind of <laughs> worldwide here, from Ohio, Jean Druzado, who is Director Emerita of the, <laughs> of the Kent State University Museum, having served as director from 1993 to 2018. Jean was curator for the exhibit, this is very important, Catherine Hepburn Dressed for Stage and Screen, and is also the author of the book, Catherine Hepburn Rebel Chic. All right, now from New York City, we have Judy Samuelson. She contributed to Rebel Chic, the book, and wrote the Catherine Hepburn timeline for the Kate's initial building campaign, which I was there for. Way to go, Judy. She is a former editor of Playbill Magazine for years and is an honorary trustee of the Catherine Hepburn Cultural Arts Center and a longtime aficionado of Kate since she was 13 years old. So <laughs> she knows a lot of stuff. And then we have from Connecticut, and I'm Connecticut too, Robin Andrioli, who's a director of development for the Kate, and she transcribed the letters, which you're gonna hear about, that were recently donated to the Kate and wrote the virtual exhibit. And if you haven't seen that, you have to check that out online. Welcome, ladies. Thank you. And, Good to be here. <laughs> yes, and, and I just wanna say again, for those of you watching, these three gals are the keepers of so much of Catherine Hepburn's history that you'll wanna to get to know them. And as we continue on with the museum and these either podcasts or online, you're gonna to wanna to join us. So I'm, I'm just telling you that. All right, let's start out with our first question. And uh, this is gonna be about 40 minutes or so, and then you'll have a chance to ask questions. And if you have questions, please ask them and we will answer them to the best of our ability at the end of this. All right, Kate was deliberate in defining her style, selecting clothes that complemented her long and narrow physique. <clears throat> and she was about five foot seven or so and had a waist, I swear, about 12 inches or so. <laughs> um, and we can show, just to start things off, the, the trousers. And if you don't have a pair of high-waisted trousers, you need to get them because Kate knew that elongated her physique. All right, so how much did image matter to her? Jean, take it. Well, I think <laughs> it was very important because she wanted to be perceived um, as, as what she was, a, a very important Hollywood actress. Um, but she also wanted to be comfortable. And I think that uh, much of what we perceive as her public image was similar to her lifestyle in private, but it wasn't the whole story. Uh, she, she dressed in various glamorous dresses in her private life as well as on the screen. And I think that that's one of the lasting influences that she had. Women could go to the movies, they could see her very glamorous, they could see her in trousers, and they would go home and think, well, 
I can still be feminine and wear trousers. I can be glamorous and wear trousers. Uh, and I think that's the influence that has persisted. Now, how much was conscious and how much was a desire to be comfortable uh, is, is a matter for Miss Hepburn. <laughs> Judy, I'm going to ask you, uh, studying mm -hmm. her and knowing her since you were 13 years old, did you see early on the moment that she decided, I'm going to whip out these trousers and here we go? Because when she first came to Hollywood, it was a different image, right? Well, that's true. But I have to say that when I first saw her, I first saw her, she was... Uh, was in uh, Guess Who's Coming to Dinner. That was already well into her um, career. So what I was seeing and what was speaking to me was what she once described as, um, you know, her star power, her the energy that came off the screen. Um, I wasn't looking at her clothes, although in Guess Who's Coming to Dinner, I, I loved her clothes in Guess Who's Coming to Dinner. But um, it was only when I, when I started um, you know, seeing more of her films and, and seeing how different she was on screen that I took note of um, some of the, the, the clothes she wore. But I think her, her, her idea of comfort was, was paramount for her. And also she had this, um, uh, uh, she liked to show that she didn't care. You know, her friend, her good friend, Laura Harding, <laughs> Uh, when she when when they met uh, when she was right out of school and uh, you know she said she would go to audition Kate would go to auditions with a a big uh, overcoat pinned to the neck with a with a safety pin and and a beret on her head and her hair sort of messed up and uh, the famous quote from Hepburn <clears throat> is that she once said to Greta Garbo um, I, I um, it takes us longer to look to 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 get up and look like we don't care than it does for anyone that is that that, that is trying to <clears throat> dress to the nines and everything. But um, um, I'm thinking back to other quotes. Her friend Lauren McCall said she did care about things and she cared about everything. And so I think that she constructed an image for herself on screen. But it, as Jean said, it it, it carried over from her from her life. Um, I've heard uh, uh, classmates of her from Bryn, of hers from Bryn Mawr would say that you know she would walk around in sneakers and skirts with you know unraveled hems, but then by the same token, she she um, had clothes made for her and she she could look you know beautiful. She would go between the two, but I think comfort was the main her main uh, goal <laughs> and practicality. Okay. Uh, I, I think that uh, um, in many respects, what she wore was practical. Uh, if you're playing tennis, wouldn't you rather play tennis in slacks and a sweater than a skirt? Um, and that was from her early childhood when she decided that dresses were a nuisance, you know? <laughs> you, couldn't, you couldn't keep up with your older brother wearing a dress. And but so- she, oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. So I, I think that that's really part of it was practicality, that good old New England practicality. And swamp yankiness too, don't you think? Yeah, yeah. I agree with Jean there. If you've seen the virtual exhibit, we were able to use some of the home film reels from the Grant family collection. And there she is in the wintertime ice skating with a family. And except for her very young sister, she's the only woman on the ice wearing pants. And it's because she was so athletic. She's doing jumps and spins and, you know, she's really a very good ice skater, in fact. Um, but all the women on the ice uh, that day are wearing long skirts. She's the <laughs> only one wearing pants. <laughs> but one of the things, one of the things that kind of spoke to me was that she had this sort of, it is in a later interview that she gave, um, um, I think to Esquire, like around the time that Guess Who's Coming to Dinner was being made, she spoke to Lee Israel and it was sort of a feminist view of, of, of her idea of clothing. You know, she's, I'm gonna read a quote because I don't remember it verbatim, but she said, the idiotic way women are forced to dress, that's just plain sad to me. No matter how free women get, they always seem to be absolutely tied into asinine clothes. I hate to see women a victim of things, which to me are totally silly. 
for instance, jewelry and dresses and stockings and shoes and a million uncomfortable high heels, all the desperately uncomfortable things for what? She said, possibly it's all right from the age of 15 to 25 during the first domination of desire to be fascinating to the opposite <laughs> sex. But once one is on to that routine, anybody who relies on all that junk to be fascinated by you isn't worth fascinating. I just think it's such a waste of time. And the, so then the cap of that, I think, is when I hear a man say he likes to see a woman in the yes. skirt, <laughs> I say, try one, try a skirt. <laughs> right, right, right. So we, we have come into um, possession of Catherine Hepburn letters. And Robin at the Cade has become uh, an expert on that. What does she say in letters to either her sisters, her mother, whatever about style? What, what, what are we learning about Kate and style? You know, what was so interesting to me is that she's very specific about how clothing should fit, but not only herself, she's very specific about how clothing should fit um, her siblings and their families. We have a couple of letters where she writes um, to her mother and she's saying, now I'm sending these shoes for Peg. Um, she's going to want to dye them this color, but don't dye them yet because first she can wear them with this other dress and they'll be perfect with the other dress. Then she can dye them red and they'll be fine. Um, there's another letter which we feature in the virtual exhibit where she says, I'm sending some things to the children, um, you know, to her sisters and you're going to want to hem this dress, but do it in this way because it's going to be much too long for her. She's so specific. Um, and then she sends Christmas cards that say, I want you to go to New York City. Uh, Huntsman and Sons Company will be there. Their gentleman Taylor will be there. He's going to fit you for a coat or a dress or riding pants, whatever it is you'd like. If you can't get there, send your measurements. I'll go, I'll fit for you. Like <laughs> she's just so specific about everything. And um, that was surprising you, to me. So Jean, in your research, how specific did you learn that she was when you started looking at the clothing well, for Rebel you, Chic? You really um, get a good idea by listening to the designers that worked with her. Because <clears throat> Edith Head, for example, said, you don't design for Miss Hepburn, you design with her. She knows exactly what she wants and what's appropriate for the character that she's playing in the film or on the stage. And so uh, it, was, it had to be collaborative. And Muriel King, who was a New York fashion designer and who Kate asked specifically to do um, both Stage Door and Sylvia Scarlet um, had a dress mannequin in her studio in New York with Kate's measurements so that she could make clothes that would fit Catherine Hepburn. And, and I think that from uh, her early adulthood, she had clothes made specifically for her. So she knew what it, what it was all about. Oh, what you're seeing on the screen is, is one of the dresses that Muriel King um, did for Stage Door. And um, later, um, Muriel King had an attic fire and a lot of her uh, scrapbooks and things were destroyed. And she wrote to Catherine Hepburn and said, you know, I've lost the still of that wispy gray Marquisette dress. Uh, do you have another one? I'd love to have it. Um, so, it was something that that they collaborated on and and had mutual respect, I think, um, for the product, uh, because everything that Catherine Hepburn wore in the movies or on stage was something that she thought was correct for the character. She was very intelligent and very um, firm about it. Let's talk about one of the designers, Valentina. Uh, Judy, let's start with what you know about Valentina. And, and Jean, I want you to um, also talk about who this designer was. Uh, well, Valentina, um, I think the first time she worked with her was on the stage um, production of the Philadelphia Story. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, Valentina was uh, quoted 
quoted as saying that, you know, finally I've made Katharine Hepburn look like a woman. So she's not dressed in trousers and she's dressed in sort of these elegant gowns. One of which, by the way, the one she wore for her wedding scene, as Jean will tell you also, uh, was um, repurposed like 35 years later when she did um, The Glass Menagerie. She wore the same dress. Um, uh, uh, I, my my co colleague, the late Louis Bado, my colleague at Playbill, saw her in the Philadelphia story. And he would tell me that when she walked on stage in the Valentina, uh, red, I'm describing it as red, I'm sure there's a much more sophisticated name for that color, yeah. but the red, the red robe with the white pleated dress underneath, uh, Kent State has that um, red robe, a red over dress um he said the audience like gasped and um so and she she said she thought valentino was a genius you know she worked with a lot of designers who she respected and liked and she like singled her out sort of as a as a real you know artist and um i said one more thing about the her reliance on costume to to um uh, reveal a character is another thing that Louis Botto told me was that um, she has a, a, a scene in the Philadelphia story, both in the play and on um, in the film, where she's a little bit tipsy after a, a party. And he told me that she wanted her shoes, the platforms of her shoes, uh, not not the soles, but around the, the edge to be to have to be jewel encrusted. So that when she played the drunk scene and, and was stumbling on stage, people mm -hmm. from the back of the theater would notice that she was, you know, a little bit, um, a little bit high. Um, so that was something that helped her mm -hmm. to, you know, uh, um, to tell the story of this character. So, Jean, you know much more about All that. Right, I, I just want to add to the to the wedding dress story. The wedding dress in that Valentina designed for Katharine Hepburn for the Philadelphia story is a very soft pink <clears throat> chiffon. And, um, and it was pink because this was the second wedding for, for the character, of course. Well, 30 years later, when she did the glass menagerie, in the script, it says Amanda, the character she was playing, goes to her trunk and pulls out a dress she had worn as a young woman being courted 30 years before. And Kate went to her closet and pulled out a dress that she had worn 30 years before to wear as Amanda. <clears throat> and that's the intelligence. That's the sense of character that says, oh, I know what's appropriate for this, for this role, for this moment. And her, her relationship with Valentina was fascinating because Valentina was the most expensive couturier in New York. And uh, when she went to her studio, she saw a dress that she said was just heavenly. And it's the one that she wore in Without Love on the stage. So um, it was another one of those uh, relationships that was very, um, very significant in terms of what's appropriate or the character on the stage or in the film. But, you know, she also said to Lewis, uh, I keep quoting him because he was such a source of firsthand information for me, um, that, uh, 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 I've just lost my train of thought here, but, um, I'm sorry, I'll get keep it talking. back. I'm getting it. We'll, we'll get Robin. it back. <laughs> a Valentina, oh, a Valentina jacket. jacket. We have this Valentina jacket at the Kate collection. It was a part of the, um, the donation from the Grant family. They had several items that we um, picked up from the Grant family home here in Fenwick. And many of those items were the letters that she had written to her family, but this Valentina jacket was among them. And so we're waiting to speak to uh, someone in the conservation area to tell us how to best preserve this jacket. You can see um, down here at the bottom of the left-hand picture where the sleeves have kind of fallen out. There was a lining there in the sleeve. It's, it's fallen out. So it needs some repair and some care, but this was um, a really nice little find amongst the things that we were given. Yeah. 
That's I just remembered. <laughs> when she was for <laughs> Judy, <laughs> she, the, the the brain uh, is a funny thing. But when she spoke to um, Lewis and she mentioned um, Valentina, and he said, "Oh yeah, she he made your your costumes for the Philadelphia story," and she said, "No, she made my clothes, yeah, my personal clothes," and that's yeah. a, a perfect uh, example of it. Yeah. yeah. I mean, who was Valentina? Because it's not Valentina. Oh. It's it, Valentina. She, Valentina Schley was her married name. She was a Russian emigre to Paris, married to a man named George Schley. And um, they emigrated to New York. And he thought, she thought she was going to be an actress. And he decided that it would be wiser if she went into the dress business. And so she was quite a character, quite glamorous and would go to every opening night. You know, she was out on the town all the time being seen. And that's the way she attracted clients. And she dressed the first ladies of the theater. She dressed yeah. Catherine Hepburn. She dressed uh, um, Alfred Lunton or Lynn Fontaine. She uh, dressed Catherine Cornell. Uh, and then she had this roster of private clients. So uh, she was quite something and she lived in a long time. Oh, I can't remember her date exactly, but it was well into the eighties when she was still alive, not working, but, but still alive. Robin, how was it that Catherine Hepburn, when she was being dressed by Valentina and, and all three of you probably can, can talk about this too, but she had very clear cut ideas about what she wanted and did all the designers listen to her? Were there letters about how she was dressing home to mom? And we should say that Catherine Hepburn was very, very close to her family, always was. And to her ending day, she came home and passed in her beloved old Saybrook. So Robin, I'm gonna let you take it from there. Yeah, well, you know, on that point, um, the letters that we have just express over and over how much she loves her family. She misses her family. She adores her parents. She's so lucky to have them as her parents. And she says that in her autobiography as well. But I uh, was, I just love reading them because of that. It, it is always so caring about her family. And um, she says, you know, I feel a million miles away. Um, I adore you. She writes one letter, which we feature in the virtual exhibit about how um, it's so peculiar to her that other children want to escape their families. They want to get away. And when she and her siblings come home, it's just the most, you know, amazing feeling in the world. This is where they want to be. And her parents should be so proud of that fact. Um, but back to the designers, you know, there are a few letters where she mentions Muriel King. Muriel King is, is being uh, selected to be the designer. So she's thrilled about that. Um, she talks about Walter Plunkett. We'll talk about him a little bit more, I think, in, in the next slide. And um, and, you know, she always says that she's so lucky that she'll be able to work with a cameraman because after she's been fitted for costumes, she likes to see how things fit her. And she wants to make sure that she's got the best angles wearing certain clothes. And so um, especially when she's doing Christopher Strong, there are a lot of letters about that <laughs> film and the fact that she gets to try on so many great outfits. Maybe it's because of that you know, wacky silver moth outfit that's <laughs> featured in that movie. That and I still don't understand the that concept. Was, yeah. <laughs> but yeah, um, so yeah, there are many times when she says, you know, we're, we're working on costumes right now and the script's not even done yet. And it's against mm -hmm. her principles to work on a movie when the script's not done, but she's always <laughs> in that situation. The scripts are never done. And then she likes to kind of, um, you know, have some influence on the script as well. Certainly was, you know, in the driver's seat for many things. Let's talk about Plunkett now because you alluded to that. Jean, you wanna uh, talk about that? Well, Walter Plunkett did more films for Katherine Hepburn than anyone. Um, he did 11 films for her. And um, he was a studio artist at, at RKO initially, and then um, worked, I guess, really where he was assigned, but it happened that he and Katherine Hepburn really understood one another. Uh, this, uh, what, um, I guess we should really play the, the, the embedded sound in this slide. Plunkett is the man and th there um, with a cigarette in his mouth. <laughs> and let's okay. listen. And yeah, have a listen. Okay, testing my technology skills. Yes. Well, I think he, he was enormously sympathetic to the, the style of the person involved. 
and had a very good sense of relation to the story because he certainly, in the things he did for me, varied enormously. And I never remember having really any problems with Walter, but he had a real uh, uh, sense of the person and the personality and what they could sort of get away with. And there are a lot of people who have a wonderful sense of style, but they don't cover up the defects of a, and the bad qualities of a figure or a face or whatever you want. And Walter had sense enough to do that. And, it, and, and I think he had sense enough to sort of feel the, uh, the way a person might feel very uncomfortable in a certain thing for no good reason. And he didn't try to push the point. <laughs> the minutia that she got down in the weeds and then says, I didn't have a problem with him. <laughs> the, uh, he, was, he was, I'm sorry, I mean, his, his, biggest, his biggest film, I guess, that people would know is, is Gone with the Wind. Yeah. Um, and I mean, he, he, he dressed her in a lot of um, period uh, costumes um, that were that were stunning. I mean, this is a woman rebels, but he worked with her on um, Sea of Grass, and apparently they poured over books, costumes of that era. Um, uh, but then he did um, uh, a, a total 360, and he designed the clothes for Adam's rib. Mm -hmm. And I think in this uh, this interview that she did with Louis Bado, uh, Kate also spoke about that and how he designed like the most wonderful collection of clothes for her to wear that she could have, you know, modern uh, uh, clothes for 1949. And, you know, she could have walked down Madison Avenue in them. So he was he was um, pretty gifted and and they were had this simpatico relationship going. Well, I think he, he oh, sorry, was guys. enormously. <laughs> I don't want to hear that again. <laughs> well, we could listen to her voice all day because it just takes you back. <laughs> this was a Noel Taylor thing. We'll talk about Noel in a minute, but yeah. So, Jean, just continue with Plunkett one more second, if you would. Well, I I was just going to say that that it and Judy alluded to it. They loved the research on the character and on the on the periods that that the films were were placed in. And they looked at impressionist paintings. They looked at, at all kinds of things from the 1880s for A, a Woman Rebels. Um, and so it, it was that kind of, of joyful research and exploration that I think um, they both enjoyed. We I, do I have just, the, the Plunkett dress. I'm sorry, I'm gonna show sure. it. Oh, oh, the Adam's rib dress. Oh, yeah, my, my favorite, my personal favorite. <laughs> It is stunning. Gorgeous. You know, uh, Jean, do you have this at Kent State? How much stuff do you have of her wardrobe there? <laughs> we have a lot of stuff. <laughs> uh, it was a warehouse full, actually, um, that came to Kent. And, um, and we do have, um, I don't know the exact number of pieces. I think there is something. But there are, we tried to keep the things that were most relevant to her career and to our collection. And our collection is a, a collection of fashion. Mm. And uh, so we were particularly interested in, in the things designed by Valentina and Chanel and, and Walter Plunkett in this case, and, and some other things like that. And how did they get to Kent State? Well, um, the estate was being settled and they wanted to place the clothes uh, in, an, in an educational institution. And there was a lot of, there was a lot of stuff, I must say. And um, nobody wanted it all. And um, they were having trouble placing it. And so they, um, they were asking around and a woman who had been the um, fashion director at Kent uh, called me and said, you know, if you're interested in Catherine Hepburn's clothes, you should write to the executors, which I did. And um, after a couple of years of, of writing back and forth and an explanation that said, well, you know, this, these complicated estates take a long time to settle. Um, we finally had a meeting. Um, I had been to Connecticut to the warehouse. I'd looked at everything. 
I'd made my list and uh, then I met with the trustees and uh, it was decided that it would come to Kent. So that's essentially how it happened. <laughs> and it travels because it was one of the most famous exhibits at the Historical uh, Society in Hartford. And I yeah. went to that and it was amazing. Yeah. And the exhibition is still intact. Uh, it doesn't include everything that we have by any means. Um, but I selected things that I thought would communicate most clearly how important the costumes were to her development of character. That's really Robin, was the motivation. Robin, let's talk about uh, Cl Calvin Klein and Coco Chanel and such. Well, of course she portrayed Coco Chanel in the musical, the Broadway musical, even though she didn't consider herself to be a musical actress or a singer, but <laughs> <laughs> Judy and Jean um, can come in more on the clothing. Judy certainly on the production. Judy was the editor of Playbill Magazine. So. Uh, it was a success for her, though. She was nominated for a Tony. I mean, she did well, even though she had all of these yeah. interferes about getting out there and doing it. But she did it. Um, oh, she, oh, sorry. I no, go right ahead. I'm so I mean, sorry. No, I mean, she she has said that her whole life as a as an actor, film and, and theater, she had this feeling that the audience was out to get to her. get her, that yeah. to trip her up somehow. She was pretty self-conscious about that I think and so she she you know stood at arm's length from them always but she has said that when she did Coco it was the first time in her career that she realized that they were that she felt this like wave of love come over the you know footlights and she realized that you know they they she said they liked you. They liked me. They weren't there to trip me up. They weren't there to, you know, so I would look foolish or whatever. And I think that was, a, you know, her first realization. It's hard to believe that she started in 19, well, in theater before the films in the late 20s. And it took her till 1969 to realize that she had an audience that really, like, you know, loved her. As Interesting. She now, was, there were insecurities to her. Yeah. yeah. Uh -huh. Look at the, the suit she's wearing on the right hand um, image, mm -hmm. that black Chanel. Now that's one of two complete Chanel ensembles that she purchased from Chanel because Cecil Beaton did the rest of the suits and you see one of his suits on the left. But Catherine Hepburn wanted the authenticity of wearing a real Chanel. And so the producers took her to Paris to meet Chanel. And she purchased these two ensembles. And then Ray Diffin, who told me this story, ran a wonderful costume shop in New York. And he did what they called the soft clothes, the rest of the, the um, trousers and, and jackets and, and negligee. And uh, Cecil Beaton had the rest of the tailored suits done in London, but Catherine Hepburn wanted to have a real Chanel. And it, it's not the kind of Chanel that any theater designer would, would create because it's at least three layers of heavy wool lined and underlined. And it, it's a skirt, a wrap skirt, a wrap dress actually, with a jacket over it. Now you're singing and dancing under stage lights. That's, <laughs> that suit was made for ladies who went to lunch. <laughs> and, and really, uh, it, it, was, uh, it was a tough go <laughs> for authenticity. <laughs> um, so, Anne, your original question was about the um, Calvin Klein quote. So she, in 1985, she is given a Lifetime Achievement Award by the Council of Fashion Designers. And... Um, Calvin Klein introduces her, I believe. And I, Jean or Judy, you guys know the full quote. I've, I've got the quote here. It says, um, uh, in her 42 films and in her life, she has truly epitomized the ultimate American woman. She's vibrant, she's outspoken, she's hardworking, and she's independent. And fortunately for all of us, she's never been afraid to be comfortable. And for that reason, fashion designers all over the world have a great deal to be grateful for. And then Hepburn responded with a grin. Imagine the original bag lady getting an award for the way she dresses. 
Judy, I know you have comments. I can see that the wheels. <laughs> well, I mean, apparently she's, she's, there's a great article uh, in uh, that ran in Newsweek when she when Coco was um, either already on Broadway or about to arrive, and and about how she went to meet Chanel, and she said Chanel in her typical you know uh, slacks and so what <laughs> kind of attitude with the cap and the kerchief over her head, and she said Chanel. Uh, looked her up and didn't bother to look her down. <laughs> um, but I think it's funny. I think what she, I think, and Chanel, who was, what was she then about 65, whatever she was. It was she, Kate's age. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, she thought Kate was too old to play her. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, Chanel was in her 80s. But yeah, but Kate was the age that Chanel was when she came back into fashion in the 1950s. Uh -huh. There's a lot of complication about, about the development of the script. Originally, it was thought that it would be Chanel's younger years. And so Chanel assumed that Audrey Hepburn would be playing her. And when she met Kate, she was stunned and, and confused because the authors had never told her that they had moved the story ahead oh. and that it was uh, her comeback period, not her youth. <laughs> So and isn't anyway, that when 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 um, Audrey Hepburn went to meet Givenchy, he thought he was going to meet Catherine Hepburn. <laughs> and, and, and then how, and then she, she didn't deal well with that, right? Audrey and Catherine, and Catherine and Audrey. Yeah. I well, I, I don't, I don't think so. Actually, there's um. Uh, George Cukor said, because um, he directed Audrey Hepburn in, in um, My Fair Lady, said that, um, that Kate referred to Audrey as his little daughter. <laughs> um, and um, no, I don't, I mean, I don't think they were, that she was, yeah. you know, there might have been, so she was much younger, so there yes. might have been, you know, some, but I don't think there really, there really was. And um, I also have seen a letter, actually I have it in my collection, when, that George Cukor wrote to Audrey Hepburn, thanking her on Kate's behalf for a condolence letter that Kate wrote to, to her when, after Spencer Tracy died. And, you know, and, and telling her how, you know, moved Kate was by, by, her, um, by her concern. So I, I don't know, I, you know, they weren't always in the same, they weren't in the same sphere at all. <laughs> You know. Robin, we can talk about fashion now. I mean, you're considerably younger than I am. You're just a kid. <laughs> Hardly. But from, right, but from your generation, you're learning and even younger women about how this fashion just continues on. Yeah, well, not, not even just the fashion, you know, trying to kind of get a, a sense of, um, why people still talk about Katherine Hepburn, why she is still so significant in the world of the arts. Um, we're going to look at a couple of slides of kind of impact on fashion. Here she is wearing denim in uh, the, I think this is a 1934 picture. Judy, you would know because it's your, your collection from your collection. This photo. She's, she's made up for Christopher Strong. Yeah. So she's wearing pants and, um, you know, this mink coat not a big fan of mink, but I wouldn't look twice at her wearing denim pants, you know, as a woman today. And back then everyone looked at her cross-eyed for it. Um, look at the sense of style in, in this photo here from a uh, woman of the year. I love this pattern, yeah. this, uh, this outfit, you know, it makes you want to be like her, but you know, I went back and after reading through all these letters, rewatched so many of the films just to get another um, perspective on Kate and who she was as a woman. Um, and, you know, one of the goals of the Catherine Hepburn Museum that we have here is to teach other generations about her, why she's significant, what are the things that she accomplished that eventually helped other women or other people in the entertainment business and outside of the entertainment business. Um, I love that her, um, her brother commented once in an article, her brother Robert, who was a physician, that you know, her philanthropy was personal. You may not see her walking through, um, you know, impoverished areas, or she wasn't a spokesperson for this cause or that cause. But she was always there for people from all walks of life at any time. 
almost with no questions asked. Um, so the way that she just kind of went through life in a very purposeful way and wanted to be a star, yes, but also, you know, never put herself above anyone. Um, one of the neat stories that we found in the clippings, we have several um, folders here of clippings and other ephemera. Uh, there was a clipping from um, an Irish newspaper because she had lent the wedding dress from the lake to a young woman who I believe was nannying for her family at the time. Um, this young woman from Ireland was getting married and she let her wear the wedding dress from the lake, which is a beautiful wedding dress. I should have shown that slide. Um, you it's know, pen. the production was a bomb, but, but she <laughs> appreciated the clothing and it, it made the newspaper in this County in Ireland where the girl eventually got married. And then she came back to the U S but they were like, wow, you know, this is the best thing ever. So she just re really was a very gener generous and genuine spirit. I have to say genuine. Jean, what did you learn by writing Rebel Chic? Well, I wasn't the only author, by the way. <laughs> well, we're just giving you credit today. <laughs> um, I really learned to uh, respect and appreciate Catherine Hepburn. You know, I really was not a movie fan from the age of 13. <laughs> and... Uh, and so I didn't know very much about her or the movies. And in fact, because there were so many things that came and we had to identify them because they weren't identified at all. I did watch a lot of, of the Hepburn films, but I watched it with the sound off because I, I didn't dare concentrate on the story. I had to look at the clothes to try to see uh, what they were and what how they were associated. So, um, but I... I have in reading all of her papers at, at New York Public Library for the Performing Arts and at the, the Herrick Library at the Academy of Motion Picture Arts and Sciences, I really had learned a great deal of, of respect and admiration for her as a performer and, and really as a person. And Judy, studying her all these years and, and being such a fan, what don't people know about her that, that you have learned along all these years? I don't, I couldn't say what people don't know about her, but I think the thing that keeps people and certainly me like continually interested in her on screen is she had this, because don't forget, I said, I, 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 I wasn't conscious of the clothes when I first saw her, or even when I went back to see her, her other films. But she had this unique ability to portray someone with a raging confidence, but right underneath the skin was this vulnerability that she, that she displayed in, I would say practically every, every role she did. And I think that that duality or that that that, that uh, the two aspects complemented each other and make her really, you know, interesting to watch. I think she was also a, 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 a technically a, a great uh, actress. David Lean, who directed her in Summertime um, and directed many great actors, um, he, she was his uh, uh, favorite um, actress, and he had said about her that she's a, a, um, a rare combination of a complete mastery of technique and a real gift. So she knew where the lights were. She knew how well she, could, she should be lit. She knew what she should be wearing. And all that contributed to what she portrayed on screen, but what she sent to the audience was not necessarily what she was wearing and not what she was, uh, not the lights and not the direction. It was her persona that just came through the screen, that energy or what she called, you know, horsepower, <laughs> that, that, that indefinable sort of, you know, chemistry thing that happens between a performer and an audience. And it happened to me. And I find it interesting that, so many of the people I know who've become friends and um, who, who are fans of hers all found her when they were, you know, young, young teenagers, that there was something about her that appealed to, you know, her independence, her, her, um, 
the way she looked, the way she sounded, that appealed to, you know, girls of, as I was then of a certain age. And um, uh-huh. hard to, it's hard to put your finger on describing what that, you okay. know, yeah. what that is, but it's certainly there. And as she said to uh, Anthony Hopkins, I think said in a, one of his uh, TCM segments on her, you know, he asked her what star quality was. And she said, I don't know, it's some kind of energy, but I don't know what it is, but I've got it. <laughs> <laughs> well, Dick, Dick Cavett is famous for saying when he saw her at Stratford and he was uh, he was at Yale and he was a young student and um, drama student and he talks about her walking down the aisle, you know, at the Shakespeare Theater and describes sparks coming off of her face <laughs> that it was just nobody could describe it, but she just had it beyond yeah. it. Robin. <laughs> Right. Isn't that what we heard too from Cher? Uh, you know, mm-hmm. Anne interviewed Cher as one of our Spirit of Catherine Hepburn Award recipients, the most recent. She said that the same thing. She grew up watching her with her mother. You know, they would sit down on a Saturday afternoon and watch these classic movies. And she just didn't know what it was. She couldn't put, you know, a phrase to it, but she was so drawn into Catherine Hepburn's performances and became a lifelong fan. And the same thing with with Christine Baranski, who was another of our uh, award recipients. She actually met her as an intern at the Stratford Shakespeare Theater and, Mm -hmm. you know, was completely in awe. Um, And even Glenn Close. Glenn Close was our second recipient and was encouraged Mm -hmm. to keep acting by Catherine Hepburn. So, yeah, people, you know, are attracted to this magnetism and you really can't put your finger on it. But I look at now this broader picture of her having the privilege of reading these letters and transcribing her letters. Um, and so for me as a person, I'm even more drawn to her than more mm-hmm. than the actress, just the actress. There's a, I have, speaking of the Shakespeare um, theater and her, her image and people's reaction to her, I'm going to read this quote also because I prepared it. <laughs> um, it's, there's a man named uh, Bob Smith, who's a, he's, I guess he became a Shakespearean scholar, but he was an intern at um, Stratford at the American Shakespeare uh, Theater when she did her seasons there in 1957 and 1960. And this is what he says. He says, I was completely starstruck, starstruck. I watched everything she did. She was bigger than life, more strident than a tree of a tree of crows. She smoked like an engine, went braless and switched cotton t-shirts, rode a bike, rode a boat up the river every day, and scolded people for being ordinary. She was impatient, self-absorbed, and the hardest working person I'd ever seen. Everyone was afraid of her, and she pretended to be afraid of nothing. Other people's expectations greeted her, greeted her every time she turned a corner. So that was what it was like to be Catherine Hepburn. <laughs> and again, she would swim in the sound just to get people's uh, yes. reaction in the middle of winter. Oh, there's this great story. Um, I think it was a John Hausman told, or no, Dick Cavett told it about John Hausman and Jack Landau, I think, who, who he was her director at, in one of the productions at Stratford. And I think she was late for a rehearsal and she was never late. And she used to go swimming in the Housatonic uh, when she was at Stratford and, and, you know, someone said, I forget which of them said, I saw her, you know, go swimming and in the, in the, in the river. And he, and he, the person said, it wouldn't dare. <laughs> yeah. right. Because there was a current in that river and she didn't care. I mean, a, a big yeah. one. <laughs> well, she said she did it. She said she did it just to irritate people, right? Yeah. Because, you, know. <laughs> you know, I just want to take this moment. Are there any questions that we need to answer from people that are are watching? Do you know, Robin? So we have left the Facebook live chat open so that people can type a question in. And while we don't have a question, we have wonderful um, reaction and very positive comments. Thank you, everybody who's watching. So many awesome Kate fans out there. We know many of you through the social media channels that you host or that you share other Kate um, trivia with. And uh, it's just nice to have this very enthusiastic audience joining us. So we'll keep an eye on the Facebook chat and you could ask a question by typing it in there. But at the moment, just lots of really wonderful um, reaction. So I thought I would take a minute and just share. We talked earlier about the um, Babani dress, which was her wedding dress. 
Mm -hmm. And while we don't have this in our collection, it's coming up in the next slide, ladies, there you go. And it's not in the Kent State University collection. We do know that it is held by David's Bridals in their collection. And so we have had some dialogue with them back and forth, but we do hope that at some point they will um, consider sharing it with an institution that can have it on display. We'd be really happy to take it here at the Kate. Um, <laughs> and then I just wanted to show you on the right side of the screen here, this is an example of one of the personal wardrobe pieces that have been added to the Kate collection. And um, Jean, these may actually have been part of Kent State at some point. Mm -hmm. and they went to auction and the Kate acquired not only jackets and trousers and blouses, um, but a, a few other really interesting pieces. And uh, we look forward to having them on display here at the Kate Museum very soon. I think the pants here um, were one of 11 pairs of trousers <laughs> that we were able to acquire. And I don't think this is the Huntsman and Sons jacket, but we do have one uh, jacket from Huntsman and Sons. Again, this was the tailor that she wanted you know, to share with her family. She writes them letters and she tells them, here, take these charts and fill out your measurements and I'm gonna have you go to New York and get fitted for them. So we do have some items that were tailored um, by Huntsman and Sons. In fact, we have a jacket that she wore to Cynthia McFadden's wedding here in Fenwick. And this is just an example of a, one of her letters um, where she talks about clothing. This letter is when she is in Paris. I think I, did I put page one here? Um, no, sorry, just page two. She's in Paris and she, this is when she takes off for Paris right after her bill of divorcement. She talks about that in her autobiography. You know, I get out of town quick with Luddy basically because I'm hoping that while I'm away, someone's gonna tell me the movie is a hit and I'm a hit. And then we get this letter in the box of things that we were given by the Grant family. And she's in Paris with Luddy and she's talking about how um, she just gets to Scarparelli. It's the first time she goes to Scarparelli and she says, I bought myself a heavenly long um, velvet coat and this um, uh, short sport winter suit. And she's really excited about all these clothes that she bought. And then in her autobiography years later, we hear that she's describing this outfit that she bought at Scafarelli and it is a hit. So not only does she have a great outfit to wear, but she also upgrades from steerage to on the way home from Europe because she knows that uh, the movie is a hit. So I just love these, uh, you know, these wonderful letters that we have that we can take and fit into the puzzle of her life. She's got so many passages in the autobiography that are wonderful, but she doesn't tell you everything, of course. And these letters fill in a little bit for us. Um, but in this particular letter, she also makes a point of mentioning that she has three Louis Vuitton suitcases, which are <laughs> marvelous, and a beautiful old tapestry evening bag. And she talks about Vuitton luggage in a couple of letters, because for her, it's kind of a status symbol. And in particular, when she um, does get that mink coat, and we're not sure the mink coat she buys is the same one that is in the photo from Judy's collection, the Archeo photo that we saw earlier, but she does talk about the mink coat and that, you know, now that she drives a Ford, it's just a natural thing that she would also have a mink <laughs> coat. And she didn't, she's telling mother, you know, I didn't spend all of my money on the mink coat. Like I had plenty of money for my living expenses because they're minor and I paid back Luddy and I paid this off. And, you know, so it's not like I went crazy buying the mint coat. It was within my budget. Um, but she says, I wear it with nonchalance. Come on. She's so funny. It cracks me up. Well, that's, okay. that's, that's a good word though, to describe the way she wore a lot of her costumes too. Yeah. I mean, they were great pictures of her I don't know that you if you have them Robin but um of her wearing that that um the evening gown that she wears that she just uh, you know she's posed like a model she's like you know razor thin and it's a beautiful dress and she just has that air of you know ease about the way she wore the clothes but it's interesting that a lot of these letters which are to someone like me and I'm sure a lot of people who are watching um are like amazing to, to read all these things. Um, but they're like from the, I mean, they go through a long period of time, but a lot of them where she's talking about the clothes are in the, in the thirties and the, in the, in the early part of her life. I mean, as she, you know, aged and matured and whatever, you know, at one point she said, you know, I, I, I wear, I wear what I wear. So I don't have to think about how to, how to dress. Yeah. And, well 
and yeah. and that she, everything's the same color, one color, one color palette. And as Jean will attest with all the you know however many pairs of you know slacks that are in the Kent State <laughs> collection, it's the same color, it's the same uh, muted um, you know tones and. Um, and then, and then she graduated to what she called her rags, you know, when she was older, that great um, uh, painting that Walter Plunkett did that you showed earlier um, of, of a pair of her patched and frayed, you know, trousers in a, in a museum uh, case um, was testament to that. So, I mean, I think, you know, as she, as she moved on, um, she had all these clothes and was willing, as you said, to lend them to other people but not wear them herself anymore. Yeah. That's Jean, to that point, uh, Judy was just making, we did have a question from someone about her quote unquote uniform of the khaki pants. And you can comment about uh, the numbers of pants that you saw in the collection. Originally we had 31 pair. Um, <laughs> and um, the, for the most part, um, it, with maybe one or two exceptions, they were custom made. They were either made at Saks Fifth Avenue at Huntsman, or at uh, Ray Diffens or another scenic studio. Uh, any place they had her measurements, she could walk in with a yard and a half of beige cavalry twill and have a pair of trousers. What were her measurements so people know? Who <laughs> knows what they were? Like in, at the height well, of the they changed. <laughs> You'll be very happy to know they changed. When I was trying to put the pants in chronological order, I actually did it by measuring the waists. Mm. And it starts out at about 18 and it does graduate to about 31. But in her early years, she was very slender. It was, you know, very slender, 32, 18, 33 or something like that. Uh, that was not entirely unusual for the time in the, in the 30s. What was unusual was her height. Uh, most of the actresses at, in her uh, period were about five feet tall, maybe five two. Uh, but Catherine at five seven was significantly taller and that made everything seem elongated, you know. Were her leading men shorter or taller or how did she work that out? All of the above. <laughs> When she met Spencer Tracy, she had on three inch platforms and that made her just as tall as he was. <laughs> and she said, I think I may be too tall for you, Mr. Tracy. And Mankiewicz said, oh, don't worry, he'll cut you down to size. <laughs> mm -hmm. I do have a quote from George Stevens though about how she wore clothes. And this goes back to the nonchalance. It says, um, here's a girl, um, she, did, she goes upstairs and she puts on a dress and she comes to the balcony and she comes down the stairs wearing this dress like a scarf, making it work for her, not conscious of it like ballet, but making this feminine aggrandizement, just wearing it like a scarf, like it grew on her. How she learned it, I don't know, because she's not that kind. She doesn't have that kind of vanity and she didn't need it. And that's a great way to end this. Um, uh, Judy, I'm going to let you have a final word. And you Can we just get two questions in? If we oh, could. Yeah. So two additional questions. Do any of our panelists know what happened to the red shoes from summertime? Oh, Jean, isn't that in the collection in Italy? Is it that, that I, you know, I don't know. I, I really don't know because we've never been able to pin down a designer for summertime. Ah, really? Mm -mm. You see oh, I love that movie here. Hmm? See what we're learning here that you go, isn't that in Italy? My gosh. <laughs> um, I would assume it is. I would assume it is in Italy because it it it's not any place that I know of. Yeah. And Robin, another question? Yes, for Jean, do you have any knowledge of uh, dressed for stage and screen making its way to Europe for exhibition? Not yet. How would Ooh. someone go about that? Like, would an institution contact Kent State and, and yeah. start to... Uh, yeah. They would need to, to contact uh, the Kent State University Museum and, and then open those sorts of, of conversations. Yeah, and find the funding for it to travel. <laughs> maybe, it, maybe it's Paris, Jean. Oh, wouldn't that be fun? <laughs> I might have to go and see it. There. That's right. Judy and I'll go. <laughs> Wait, I'm coming. 
<laughs> Any other questions, Robin? That was it for the questions. Thanks, Anne. All right, uh, Judy, um, a few more words and then Robin, I'll let you have the final say. Um, there's a famous quote that she um, uh, has said or that's been quote attributed to her, which is if you obey all the rules, you miss all the fun. It sounds like a very Katherine Hepburn thing to say, but I believe that she had rules, very definite rules about, uh -huh. um, uh, about um, behavior, about character, about how to judge between right and wrong for herself. And often she, she um, extended that to the people around her. Right. Um, um, but I think she was, you know, disciplined and, and uh, just a, 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 a things you learn now from the letters about her life, as Robin said before, they just, even the ones that aren't of any personal nature, and, and I'm sure there are many of those that, you know, are not available, and that's just fine, that's as it should be, but the ones that you, you read about, you learn so many little things about the way she lived her life, and, and, and especially going back always to her you know, love of family, which I can certainly relate to. And I know a lot of people, people can, um, there's an, not an interview that she, that she did ever really without, um, talking about her parents and, and that life with her siblings and, um, and she was a great star. She was a great actress and, and continues to fascinate so many people after how many years since she's been gone, you know? Um, so and That's still great. four Academy Awards, the most of any actress. Mm -hmm. So far. And yeah, so far. Robin, and I'll let you have the final word. I just want to say thank you all for, you know, helping us out with this. Uh, putting the virtual exhibit together, first of all, was really inspired by the letters that we received from her family. And I encourage everyone to watch that. Uh, we'll have more museum programs coming up. We are um, starting a program called the Kate Enthusiasts. And you can become a Kate enthusiast and help us to sustain this wonderful legacy of hers. But it's an opportunity for us to also bring some different programs, mostly virtually. Actually, we've kind of gotten the hang of this, but so that we can reach fans all around the world um, to share some more of what we have in our collection. And if you're ever in Connecticut, please come and see the Kate and the Kate Museum that we have here. It's really a privilege for us to um, kind of hold on to her story and to be able to share it with people. Jean and Judy and Robin, thank you so much for your expertise. And this has been a lot yeah. of fun. And it's I hope we get fun. to do it again because we've just scratched the surface, girls. <laughs> it's true. Thank you, Anne. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, thank you very thank you. much. Have a great day. Bye. Bye-bye. <laughs>